Hello, my name is Ottmar Edenhofer. I'm the director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research in uh, Germany. Uh, at the same time, I'm professor for the economics of climate change. And today, uh, I'm very happy that we have a, a great seminar on climate policy in times of war. And I'm very uh, pleased that we have three important and great panelists. And let me start with uh, Veronika Grimm. Veronika Grimm is professor of economic theory at the Friedrich Alexander University uh, in Nuremberg, Erlangen, uh, in Germany. And she studied economics and sociology at several universities. And uh, she is now uh, the member of the German advisory uh, a committee on economics, what we call in German the Wirtschaftsweisen. So Veronika Grimm will speak today about the political reactions within the EU and Germany on the current crisis. And uh, Veronika Grimm is very much involved in the public debate on this issue. So our second panelist is Georg Zachmann. So he is a senior fellow at the Brussels-based think tank Brügge, and he's an expert on climate and energy policy. And he has published very important papers on the current Ukraine crisis. And today he will talk about the market situation uh, on the gas and on the oil market and appropriate response actions uh, to the war in the Ukraine. And uh, the third panelist is Philippe Matar. He's professor of economics at the Department of Economics at Science Science Pro. And uh, he is chair and he's an expert on macroeconomic policy. And he will talk today about the macroeconomic risks like inflation and also the impact, the macro impact of the current energy crisis in Europe. Every panelist has uh, 15 minutes. Uh, for the statement, and then I will try to facilitate a debate among the panelists. And if there is an agreement, I would like to make sure that we understand the agreement among the panelists. If there's a disagreement, uh, so I see my main role to make the disagreements explicit. So after 45 minutes, or a little bit later, so then I will open the debate uh, to, to questions, to the Q&A, and we will uh, end uh, the, our webinar punctually um, uh, after 90 minutes. So first, I would like to invite uh, Georg Zachmann uh, to inform us about the current status on the gas and on the oil market, and in particular, uh, on issues like uh, the price cap for oil and gas, uh, the embargo, and in particular, uh, so to say, what he calls a grand bargain to steer uh, Europe through the current energy crisis. So, Georg, hand over to you, uh, 15 minutes, and I hope you can explain us everything what we have to know to understand the current crisis. Yes, thanks a lot, Otmar. Uh, exciting times. and uh, well, I would like to, uh, to essentially have two pitches and uh, would uh, try to rush a bit through, uh, uh, hoping that the uh, that we are then getting some some questions to uh, to put up a discussion. So let me start first with um, some sorts on the um, on essentially the, the war type element. So kind of the the sanctions, counter sanctions uh, with uh, with Russia and uh, and what we are experiencing right now, because I think it's also for the long term decarbonization agenda quite uh, quite relevant. Now, um, quickly going through the, the three main uh, main fuels and kind of pointing a bit to where we stand and and what is still ahead. Now. Oil, uh, Russia is a, is a major oil exporter. If you if you see the numbers, uh, they have been exporting around eight million barrels per day, which is about eight percent of global production. So it uh, it is uh, very uh, very substantial. More than a third of that went to the EU. More than half of that, essentially, to the West or a pro-Ukrainian coalition, as one might call it now. And both crude oil and oil products are important. And, and diesel, for example, is a is a challenge at the at the moment to to be replaced. And 
in Europe. Now, what did Western sanctions essentially uh, do? Well, the UK and the US relatively quickly started to sanction Russian oil imports, which was less of a problem for them because they went elsewhere. Um, the EU sanctions will only kick in in December for crude, if I'm uh, not mistaken, and for products in, in February next year. And uh, most importantly, the sanctions that the EU um, has currently agreed are going to undermine also exports to non-EU countries and non-Western countries. So the idea is that uh, insuring and shipping of this oil will be, uh, will be sanctioned, which might in the end uh, yeah, slash a significant amount of Russian oil uh, exports out of the market. Now, we have started to, to track a bit of Russian oil exports to see how they, how they reacted. So you can see the, the corresponding track on our website. What we don't track is pipeline exports. So therefore, I, I flag that here. Uh, so there is the exports to China are, will still continue to go on. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a pipeline to China and there is a port in the Pacific, which probably will not be affected by, by Western sanctions. There is um, the, the pipeline system that I showed you on the, uh, on the map before. The Drushpa pipeline to uh, to Europe, which is not insignificant, and uh, currently oil seems to be still flowing until June. But in August, uh, we already saw that the Russians stopped transiting, essentially oil through the uh, through the southern arm, uh, which we might not, which Russia claims has to has to do with the inability to pay for the uh, for the Ukrainian transit. So uh, a clear strategy that we also see in the guest that they link our sanctions to the inability to uh, to deliver um, uh, to deliver fuels to us now the um, what we what we observe in the in the first yeah first months of this year is essentially the imports to the EU have been slightly uh, gone down so the the uh, the sick red line that you that you can see on the on the graph while the um, while the imports of Russian oil by mainly India, China, have essentially surpassed by now the, uh, the imports that, uh, that the EU has been taking from there. So we see rerouting is already happening. Um, and if we look into the, uh, into the European Union uh, statistics, what we also observe is that most countries have not changed behavior much, uh, a part of the Baltic countries that got a bit less and Hungary that got a bit more. So there is also some reshuffling in, uh, inside the EU, but nothing dramatic to, uh, to that date. Now, the big question that I think we, we, we should discuss and, and, and that is being discussed politically and for which we, uh, for which we need a good plan is, um, whether we are going for the for the full embargo that is planned by the end of the year on a European level, or whether we find a smarter tool uh, that is uh, has better cost benefit ratio for the uh, for the EU. So the current plan is essentially a cliff edge that, if implemented very effectively in terms of sanctioning uh, shipping, might slash some three to five million barrel per day off the market. So that's three to five percent of the of global oil supplies, and um, in in normal times that would be uh, would be very drastic. And the current times are already yeah, showing a very uh, very tight market conditions, and it has the potential to upset other trading partners if you essentially implement secondary sanctions on them. So the G7 is pretty nervous about the macro consequences and the political consequences. And what they came up with is this idea of a price cap, which has as an idea to allow exports to India and China and, and other non-pro-Ukrainian countries if the Russians sell at a, uh, at, a, uh, at a price that is below this cap, which is going to be administrative nightmare. And I think we are essentially pushing the Russians into the arms of the others by, uh, by telling them, OK, do all sorts of kickbacks with the Indians and Chinese to, to get your oil. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively skeptical that this is a, this is a good idea. The other option that is being discussed is, uh, is still an idea of putting a tariff on oil that is imported by the EU. And I think that that would have a much better cost benefit ratio um, as kind of we would still uh, not harm ourselves and we would manage to reduce the, um, uh, the, the income of Russia in the same way as we could do with the, with the price cap. 
The second element is, uh, is, is natural gas exports. Here, uh, even, even more strikingly, Europe was the biggest market in, in volume and even more in, in value uh, to, to China. There's only a small pipeline. And we had Turkey started to import a bit more at the, uh, since last year and, and continues to do so. And what we, what we have seen this year is essentially that you know, already last year, that since summer, uh, last year, uh, I don't know whether you can see my mouse pointer, uh, the, uh, the Russians started to reduce quite significantly the, the gas exports to the European Union, and that trend has continued uh, into 2022 towards a situation where we are getting yeah, a quarter, a fifth of what we usually got from the Russians, resulting in very high prices. Now, the Russians essentially linked that to, uh, to, to our sanctions. They were saying, okay, uh, we, we cannot pay them in, uh, or they cannot use the, the dollars and euros, we pay them anymore, so we should pay them in rubles. That was the first uh, blip in, uh, in, in spring, and then they had these technology things with, with Nord Stream. So they clearly use the, uh, the, the, the gas um, as, a, as a tool to, to try to push back on, uh, on our sanctions. Um, and here I have a very provocative question, and my provocative question is, um, do we potentially want to find a robust arrangement to, to trade gas with Russia in the, in the future. So is there is our policy that says by 2027, we are not going to import gas from Russia anymore, is that credible? Uh, or uh, is there the risk that we go back in, in one or two years time to a, to a world where Russia starts to selectively supply individual European companies in individual countries, or decides to flood the market in order to, to kill all the projects that have now been uh, started at, at very high gas prices, as they used uh, after, the, after the shale gas revolution in the US. So I am wondering whether we should not invest some time also in, in terms of thinking on, on what could be a robust arrangement for, for the European side to, to get very good terms of trade in, uh, in this, to not help the Russians finance their, their war, war efforts, but at the same time that, uh, that kind of is credible enough for, um, 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 for not being susceptible to, uh, to, to essentially being flooded with, with cheap Russian gas at a, at a certain moment in, uh, uh, in, the, in the next decade. Uh, that would probably be uh, quite quite damaging for uh, for a lot of the investment projects that are currently going on, and maybe the safeguarding could also help the investment projects today to to better uh, take off. Then on coal exports, um, there is the only uh, only real sanctions that the Europeans have actually put in place. Maybe on top of electricity, where the countries that imported electricity from Russia themselves stopped. Uh, so here, since August, we are not buying anymore. But the effect of that has essentially been a global reshuffling of coal um, trade in the uh, uh, globally. So that uh, I'm not sure whether Europe is much harmed, and I'm not sure whether Russia is much harmed. It's it's largely uh, reshuffling. Um, but um, yeah, our data on that are, are relatively modest, so I'm not pushing to it. So on, on this, the way ahead, I mean, we, have, we see here that the Russian revenues from oil, gas, and, and coal selling have not gone down, uh, despite all our efforts on, uh, on, on discussing sanctions, at least. Um, yeah, my, uh, my take would be it would be good to, to discuss tariff on oil imports, managing gas uh, imports potentially with a cap or something, and new diversification tools. So I wonder whether Europe as a whole now in the thinking also about the new energy world can find ways to not get into this um, one-sided dependencies that we, uh, that we got with Russia in the past because that was clearly unsustainable. Now, I would quickly um, jump presentations to another one on the uh, on the paper and uh, I hope I'm not too fast at the moment so that's, that should be it so this is a this is a paper we released um, essentially I think last week and the um, the idea of this paper is to say um, the, the current energy crisis is not only um, one about very high prices at the moment, uh, which is uh, most of the political attention on, but it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a crisis that goes very deep to the roots of the, of the European energy system, but also potentially to, to deeper kind of undermining trust between member states and, and being politically extremely divisive uh, potentially in the, in, the, in the coming weeks and, and months. And I mean, we are seeing signs of that. Um, 
what um, we argue is that the current pri uh, crisis that we see is not entirely due to the Russia shock. The Russia shock is only one of, of three things that we are uh, that we are experiencing, and I think it's very important to make that make that point. Uh, we have seen significant underinvestment in the uh, in the past decade compared to uh, to the demand that we uh, that we currently experience. Um, so. Uh, the question is what went wrong and what can we learn from that? Then there is the Russia shock, and then there is this, uh, uh, we call it here unfortunate coincidences of French nuclear power plants uh, being being offline in the, at the yeah, lowest level in, in many, many years, and the, and the droughts that, uh, that reduced hydropower production quite, uh, quite substantially. So we are having kind of a perfect storm, and the, the results of that are, are drastic. So the, the risks that we are seeing um, on the one hand, uh, political, so being played by uh, by Russia, what I explained before. Um, but what I am very much afraid of is that um, um, that we will get into a system where member states will try to uh, pull the tissue of uh, limited uh, energy supplies towards them by subsidizing uh, um, energy uh, domestically. And we see that happening quite, quite strongly in, in different member states and in different forms. The problem is the amount of energy that we can get into Europe with higher prices is almost inelastic by now. That means every euro that one country spends to uh, to, to allow its consumers to, to buy more energy means that another country has less energy available in the European Union. And we are essentially in, an, in a subsidy battle for the last remaining kilowatt hours that are available on the market. And that's pushing up prices. And I think in this situation, we, we very clearly need some sort of moratorium on, on supporting energy consumption in Europe. And uh, that's politically extremely difficult because, um, I mean, we're all speaking to different ministries. And the, the first reaction is, yet, yeah, please help our energy consumers to be able to, to consume the same amount of energy they used to consume. While we all know that, um, uh, that demand reduction that we potentially need to, to get over next winter is something in the order of 15% yeah, or so for, for natural gas and, and a bit less for electricity. So um, my, uh, yeah, my, my main worry is that uh, the countries like Germany with deep pockets might be able to, to put a lot of money on the table to, to buy energy uh, from, uh, from markets, meaning that other countries in the European Union are not able to do so, but other countries having the, uh, the, the possibility to essentially close borders and thereby um, to, to kind of keep energy domestically. We see that to a certain degree in, um, in, in Spain uh, that, uh, that seemingly has reduced a bit the, the exports of electricity to, uh, to France. We see discussions in, uh, in Norway, and I mean, they will also pop up in, uh, in other countries. So we need to find a way to, um, to, uh, to avoid that. And the, um, um, the discussions that we are seeing now on price caps are, in my view, going in the, in the, in the wrong direction here, because I don't think we have a problem of, uh, of prices being dramatically uncoupled from, uh, from reality, but we have a problem of having too little, uh, too little energy available. And one side point that, that I would like to highlight, and I would love to, to have an yeah, hour-long discussion with you about that, is the question of the um, of the um, kind of ecosystem of European energy company and the energy finance nexus in Europe? Because that's something I do not fully understand, but I understand that we now have uh, liquidity problems in the first uh, first European countries where energy companies are getting hundreds of billions of euros in, in liquidity support to to sustain the higher prices, and at the same time, uh, yeah, companies being bailed out or renationalized. And I wonder whether there is a risk of, uh, of uh, kind of piecemeal national solutions, no joint supervision of what is happening, that, uh, that this thing spirals out of control. Because my understanding is that all these energy companies are highly interrelated with each other and with the financial sector, because there's a lot of lending and the, the volumes we are talking about in the, uh, in, the, in the electricity trade is, I think, the, just the sales volume of the electricity is something like 10% of GDP. So it's not trivial anymore. Now, what are, we, what are we suggesting? What we are suggesting is essentially we would like to, to, to try to solve the, uh, the problem on the, on the fundamental side, so with demand and supply measures. Uh, on the demand side, the, the hope would be to, to really um, find tools to, uh, to encourage uh, um, 
individual consumers to uh, to reduce consumption with, uh, with, yeah, with, with either compensation uh, tools or campaigns or mandates or regulations also unlock politically difficult uh, demand reduction like regulatory measures so saying okay you, you have to uh, you are allowed now to reduce the temperature in housing by a certain degree and on the supply side to uh, um, yeah, to see what we all have still available i think there is still fuel switching potential uh, quite significantly available that uh, that for some environmental reasons is not yet allowed we still have the, the nuclear plants i think there's a, uh, going to be a discussion about that um, also uh, the the coal fired power plants um, but also on a, on a, on a, in terms of renewables, I'm not entirely sure whether we need all these rules that are constraining, uh, for example, solar panels to be only fixed on, on rooftops, which is going to be very, very difficult. I mean, we need those solar panels to be deployed very quickly. So why, if we only need it for the next, uh, next decade, can we not put it on, uh, on fields? Uh, I mean, this is easily to be removed later on. Um, I think we... Uh, if we talk about a wartime economy, maybe things that uh, that have been unsinkable in a situation of prices of 15 euro per megawatt hour for uh, um, uh, for gas uh, are showing different trade offs at at 150 or uh, or 300 euro per megawatt hour. And to keep the whole thing together, our take would be everybody brings something to the table. Problem being that the spillovers are, are the strong positive spillovers from the demand and supply side actions uh, of what member states are doing. Uh, so every member state has no incentive necessarily for its own to do it too much on this because it will just reduce the European price. Um, so we need some sort of grand bargain and potentially to make this bargain happen we, we could also think about some sort of energy security fund some utilization to to help some countries that bring more to the table to be compensated for this uh, if you think for example for dutch gas production uh, i understand very well that the dutch government the dutch population is not super eager to to go there but the benefit that uh, that europe would take from that would be uh, would be enormous and yeah, with that, I think uh, Otmar unmuted, and I think it's a good time to, to stop here. Yeah, th thank you very much, Georg. That's great. Um, I think uh, uh, we should now uh, go through the, all the presentation, and then we can uh, facilitate the debate. And uh, I think the design of your grand bargain is, is, is very interesting. So we will discuss uh, at the later stage what is the likelihood that such a grand bargain can be implemented in a, in a credible way. So for the time being, Georg, thank you very much. I would like to hand over to Veronika uh, uh, on her view on the political reactions and the policy measures within the EU and in Germany. Veronika. I think um, Georg um, and I, we are very complementary in what we uh, will talk about. So uh, my focus is um, first um, also on the energy prices uh, in Europe. And um, this concerns the gas prices. Uh, Georg talked a lot about uh, the gas prices, but this concerns also um, the electricity prices uh, that are increasing now uh, by quite a bit uh, in uh, recent weeks. And um, at the same time, uh, we have um, still a, a lot of pressure on global supply chains. And I think it's worthwhile to briefly look at the intermediate term um, in order to just get a good picture of what this crisis is about and how we have to think about immediate measures uh, to um, deal with the um, prices and uh, the uh, energy crisis, um, how we have to think about the lo longer term um, in order not to damage too much of the conditions to get out of this situation again. So what in Europe, high energy prices and inflation, we have supply chain pressure, raw material shortages, and also uh, shortages of skilled work. And we are in a situation where we need a lot of investment. And here you see um, some calculations uh, that we have done on the future um, electricity system. So pre-war, uh, the uh, expectation, especially for Germany, was that we will substitute our 
coal and our nuclear power plants by investing in gas power plants in order to switch to an energy system um, that relies on renewables on the one hand, but of course, in order to deal with the fluctuation of renewables, um, there was a need to invest in gas power plants that in the long run can be ban run by hydrogen um, as soon as uh, this is available, but this is um, in the far further future. So um, at the same time, we see that until 2030, um, of course, renewables will ramp up a lot. We would have to, uh, we would have uh, seen investment in a lot of gas power plants. This is, of course, um, uncertain right now, because who invests in these plants that are needed to substitute coal and nuclear uh, in the medium term? Electricity uh, consumption will increase. Um, so the um, government anticipates uh, that it will increase by 30% uh, due to electrification, heat pumps, um, electric mobility, and so on. So we will have more electricity uh, consumptions with uh, these gas plants that are needed. We need to uh, think already now um, about um, building up a, a network for hydrogen, which will take quite some time. And these are all this, um, decisions that are needed right now that cannot be postponed uh, very much because we need uh, somehow a way out of uh, this crisis in a time where, of course, all these ramp ups and all these investment decisions um, will be challenged by shortages of material and skilled uh, work. What will happen uh, to our electricity system in the short run? Now, in the short run, we have to avoid uh, gas consumption. Georg um, emphasized it, and I think this is very true. We are not yet uh, in a situation where we have um, um, where we have downscale gas consumption enough in order to get safely through the winter. I mean, we can get there, but we are not yet there. Um, so we have to substitute um, gas also in the electricity sector by coal power plants in the short run. And there is a big discussion in Germany about whether to extend the lifetime of the three existing nuclear power plants by um, either a few months or even a few years. I think the government has uh, decided to do a few months, but not yet has decided uh, to um, extend the lifetime by a few years, which might be reasonable if you see uh, that there's a lot of need for coal um, electricity production um, in the next years um, if you don't invest enough in gas uh, power plants or if we have to still limit uh, the consumption of gas in the power sector. So this is a situation and I think this is a situation uh, that is very challenging in the European market um, and also the uh, price pressure that we see at the moment, of course, is due to the high gas prices that increase the prices that are bid by gas power plants into the electricity market, but it's also uh, caused by the low availability of the nuclear power plants in France, um, which also um, extends uh, the pressure uh, at the electricity market. So in the um, longer run, um, how much um, coal electricity production we will see in Germany will depend very much on the gas price. Because um, whether coal power plants will run or will not run in the German electricity mix in the upcoming years will depend on whether gas power plants are before or after the coal power plants in the merit order. And this depends on the gas price. If the gas price is very high, um, the coal uh, power production will be called first. Um, and if the gas price becomes lower, and then, of course, the gas uh, power production uh, will um, dominate coal, but only if, of course, enough gas is available. And as we just heard, this will take quite some time uh, until gas is available so that we can really count on this solution. So there are a lot of things that we uh, could talk about. Uh, so the question is not only how long will the coal power plants stay in the German electricity mix, but the question is also how much will they produce just due to um, the um, 
uh, just due to what happens on the electricity market, which of course depends on the relative prices of coal and gas power production. And this will have all kinds of impacts. For example, if the gas price becomes or stays quite high, then there will even be an incentive to um, um, to um, uh, to to uh, to to stop or uh, to reduce um, the um, this um, uh, the um, to, to to keep more coal power plants in the market also in um, neighboring countries like for example Poland. Uh, so um, this might um, actually uh, be something that puts um, the CO2 emission trading system very much under pressure if there's a lot of uh, coal power production in Germany and uh, in Poland and in neighboring countries. Um, so what is urgent immediately, I think, is that we have to activate uh, really all the available capacity for electricity production at the moment in order to get the prices down again. So we think a lot of um, intervening in the electricity market design. There's a lot of debate on this in Germany as well as in Europe. Uh, but of course, instead of or before you think extensively um, about intervening in the market design, I think it's um, the first um, task to really make all the capacity, the production capacity of existing power plants available. There are a lot of power plants that are currently in the reserve in Germany. It's um, coal power plants for sure. Uh, there are some nuclear power plants which are um, which should be switched off, um, should have been switched off um, at the end of this year, but now they are extended. Uh, two of them are extended for some months in order to get us uh, safer through the winter. But of course, one could also think about um, extending them for three or four years so that we shift the marriage order um, to the right uh, so that um, the price um, just gets lower because of um, more um, supply of electricity, more cheaper supply of electricity being available at the electricity market. Um, I think at the same time we have, at, when we do this, we have to think um, about overcoming this situation by building gas power plants and by making in the longer run hydrogen available to fuel the gas power plants with renewable energy. So uh, basically, if we don't decide on this um, in very short time, um, the, the, the longer we wait, basically, uh, the longer this crisis will um, go on because we have no uh, good alternatives to overcome um, the um, intermediate power production by coal and by nuclear. And I think this is um, especially challenging because uh, the coal power production will increase CO2 prices in the European emission trading system. Um, and uh, the question then is, um, how the political discussion will go on if uh, the emission prices, um, on top of all the uh, high prices that we observe already right now, will um, increase beyond what was expected uh, beforehand. This situation, of course, um, is very challenging also for um, the um, people in uh, all European member states. Uh, in Germany, uh, the MCC, um, Otmar and uh, colleagues have done a very nice study uh, where they quantified what are um, the what is the bur financial burden uh, that um, comes for um, first gas uh, households that are heating with gas in Germany. And um, for households, on the other hand, that are not heating with gas, uh, but otherwise. And you see here, um, so red is, um, um, uh, no, no, sorry, on the right hand side, um, you see um, in every picture in, in both sides, um, the households that do not heat with gas and on the left hand side, red and uh, green, you see um, the burden for households that heat with gas. Um, so what you see is that in Germany, due to the high price hikes uh, of gas, um, the households heating with gas um, 
experience a particularly high burden. They don't uh, experience it yet because not all the prices have been passed through to the people, but um, in any case, uh, they will uh, they will have uh, four or five times as high tariffs to pay for their gas consumption. And of course, households up to medium uh, intermediate incomes uh, will not be able to bear that. And I think um, this is a very big challenge that has not been addressed yet, uh, that uh, these um, households have to be, uh, there has to be some support, some particular support for these households so that they have the feeling that they can come to the, through the crisis and pay um, their bills. What has been decided already in Germany is a relief package. So there was a first and a second relief package. Now there was a third relief package. Um, it is um, an amount of what was announced, 65 uh, billion euro and there are support um there's support uh, for transfer recipients for pensioners and for students um there is an intention to extract random profits um at the electricity markets to finance basically a price cap um on uh electricity for basic demand for every household a household, but it is still unclear how this exactly should work. And I think um, it is it depends very much how deeply you intervene into the market design, um, how much you can really extract on these markets. Um, then um, there is um, very uh, curiously, there is a suspension of an increased step of the CO2 price in the mobility and the heat sector, it should have been increased by five euro um, in uh, 2023. But this is um, um, this is uh, suspended for the moment, which is somehow a bad signal for climate uh, protection. Uh, so I think the relief that households will um, have by this is minimal. Uh, but the signal um, that climate protection is at stake is big in a way. Uh, so this is not understandable why uh, this exactly happened. Um, the biggest surprise uh, in this relief package is actually that support, particular support for gas customers is missing. And this was really surprising because they will experience or already experience uh, a, quite a big burden. I have talked to many people who paid 100 euro per month up to now, um, and now it increased to 800 euro per month. Um, and this is something that, of course, a household with a normal income uh, can hardly bear uh, for uh, quite some time. Um, so I think. Um, what is uh, particularly um, frightening is um, the intention to intervene in the electricity market design. And there, there are a manifold of proposals. I think uh, you can um, order them somehow. So um, one kind of proposal says um, that there should be a price cap for gas that is used in the electricity production. So making the marginal technology uh, cheaper, basically, that is one intervention that is um, proposed. That would, uh, and the hope is that this decreases prices immediately without any further intervention. I'm not sure whether this is um, a clever way to go. Um, the second types of proposal is um, to propose that there should be different markets for technologies with high and low marginal costs to separate, so to say, the market for um, gas, um, electricity uh, production by gas, power plants, and uh, by the rest, uh, which is also uh, difficult to imagine how this could work out. Um, there is There are proposals uh, to tax windfall profits, um, and there are uh, so-called windfall profits uh, also depends what you did, how you determine them. And there are proposals to put a price cap on electricity. And I think this is um, a very difficult discussion. And I think we have to be very careful that there is no permanent damage um, done to uh, the electricity market. 
Um, many of these proposals might really worsen the situation in the medium term. Price caps, for example, increase the incentives to consume electricity, or if you do it with gas, uh, they increase uh, the incentive to consume uh, gas. And this is, of course, something that is very counterproductive at the moment. Um, the um, separation of markets for different technologies um, will be very difficult, as well as any other intervention into these markets, because um, firms typically trade beyond the power exchange. So there are long-term and um, immediate contracts at the power exchange and um, beyond the power exchange. And there are also long-term contracts, contracts existing. So, and energy imports and exports. And it's very difficult to imagine how uh, exactly you can intervene into these markets so that it really works out and um, market participants don't avoid um, the intervention by just trading, um, otherwise um, inventing new tariffs. Uh, and uh, I think this is very dangerous to do it because in the end you will end up not extracting the profits, but damaging uh, the markets a lot. Um, so yeah, if measures have to be taken, then I think it is um, worth to think about um, proposals that aim at taxing uh, the revenue from inframarginal electricity production whenever gas fired power, power gas fired power plants are the marginal production technology this could maybe um lead to um some revenue extraction but i doubt that this will lead to a lot of revenues and uh, if you look at the um german relief package then you see uh, that for a huge part of the package, it's not clear how it should be financed. So um, this suggests um, that politicians um, hope that a huge part of it is financed by the intervention in the electricity markets. And um, I would doubt that this uh, will be possible in the end. And it will take uh, it will take quite some time. Uh, so um, the um, relief package says that um, this should be discussed at the European level. And only if the discussion at the European level is not successful, then it should be implemented at the national level. So I think we will also see a lot of discussions on this, uh, but not a lot of um, real action. Veronica, so, um, close. Yeah, OK, so um, that's uh, that's my last slide. Okay. Uh, basically, um, what uh, are reasonable measures um, that could be taken? I think first uh, we have to decrease demand for electricity and gas through price signals and simultaneously support low and medium and medium income groups in order to be able to be at that. Um, this has two advantages. Uh, they um, are in the position so uncertainty um, is reduced and um, also electricity and energy uh, consumption is reduced. Um, we have to massive, massively and, in, and fast uh, increase uh, the electricity supply. Uh, so um, this is something that has to be focused on. This is not done um, consequently enough. Um, one could um, have some measures to extract inframarginal profits, but it's not clear whether this um, works out as far as one uh, as politi politics finds it desirable. Um, and one should um, procure gas among EU member states jointly. And um, it is, in my view, attractive to combine it with contracts on hydrogen and derivatives of hydrogen, and maybe discussions, um, negotiations on critical raw materials. And uh, my last uh, slide illustrates a little bit uh, what this could be about. I think it is very difficult to procure gas with short-term contracts um, um, at the moment, um, but maybe it is possible if you uh, combine negotiations on the long-term um, um, on the long-term um, procurement of renewable energy sources, um, then maybe there are attractive deals um, to be made worldwide, maybe also with democratic countries, but not only. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Veronica, thanks. Great for this excellent presentation. Now, before we uh, start with the discussion, I would like now to invite Philip 
uh, to talk about the macroeconomic risks of uh, this crisis. Philippe, please. Okay, thank you, Otmar. Hi to everybody. So uh, indeed, I'm going to talk a little bit about the macro dim dimension of this issue, although uh, Giorgio already uh, mentioned some of, uh, of the issues I want to talk about. So I'll talk about the impact of, of war on inflation, but pretty quickly, because in a sense, I think um, we know quite a lot on this. Uh, then I'll talk about the policy measures, debates and questions. And here, I would uh, stress that there are many things we don't know and that it's difficult uh, in, from that point of view uh, to, to give uh, a robust uh, policy recommendations. In a sense, I think we should not forget that we are in uh, uh, truly exceptional circumstances uh, and that uh, the policy instincts, instincts that we have as economists, which are fine in normal circumstances, we should be ready to question them um, in face of these exceptional circumstances and in face also of some of the uncertainties that we have on some empirical estimates. Um, so there are many things uh, we, we, we do, uh, we, we don't know uh, very, very well and I'll come back to this. And then I've been asked to say just a word on, on nuclear uh, energy in France. I'm not super competent, so I'll be, I'll be a bit short on, on that and I'd be uh, very happy to hear more from, from you. So on, on the impact of war on inflation, um, yes, the role of war inflation was, was very important, but as already said, inflation started to, to increase, uh, if, uh, in fact, before uh, the, the war in Ukraine, we were already around 5% uh, by, by the end of the year, uh, maybe part of the increase of the um, of energy prices, in particular of gas, and that was uh, already quite high. Uh, during the, the fall was linked to the preparation of the war by, uh, by the Russians, uh, but, um, but it was already high and it was uh, 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 the fact that we had, uh, of course, a, a big um, increase in, in demand due uh, to the uh, exit of COVID, uh, to problems of, uh, of uh, global supply chains, etc. And then we have, uh, of course, the acceleration uh, after, after the war. Uh, today, basically, uh, um, uh, we are at around 9% in the Eurozone, and the ECB tells us that mechanically, uh, uh, out of this 9%, 4% is coming directly from, uh, from energy. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, um, uh, there's contagion of the uh, increase in energy prices through the supply chain so to, towards uh, uh, other sectors. So it's a bit more than uh, actually 4%. So clearly, uh, the inflation problem uh, is, uh, is, is mainly uh, uh, at this stage still uh, in Europe a, 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 an energy problem. Uh, um, we see some contagion. This is the case I've looked at France in particular, some contagion uh, across other sectors, uh, industry for, in some sense, mechanical reasons, but also in, in, in services. For the moment, though, we don't see much of a wage price uh, uh, um, uh, contagion, uh, or, uh, uh, and, and from that point of view, uh, if you look at real wages in, in Europe, in the Eurozone, they have been falling. Uh, so sadly, they will react, but with, uh, with delay. But at this point, uh, it doesn't seem that wages are uh, increasing that much. By the way, and, and, and as a macroeconomist, we should be always uh, modest. I think we should uh, uh, acknowledge that as macroeconomists, we don't understand super well the dynamics of inflation. Uh, that's, and that's obviously a, a problem. Typically, the way we explain inflation dynamics to our students uh, through the neo keynesian Philips curve is that there are three components, uh, and, and the three of them are important in, in the present story. Uh, of course, the one uh, that uh, we have in mind I already talked about is the cost push shock for inflation, uh, and that's, 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 the big, uh, that's the big part here. The second one, typically, uh, is about uh, what's happening on, on the labor market uh, and, and through, uh, through, through, through wages. Uh, and here, the fact that we have, uh, in some sense, uh, the word perfect storm was already mentioned, that's exactly this. We had both on the supply and the demand side, uh, bad news for inflation. Uh, so it's true that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, ex some excess demand. However, as I said, 
the um, the uh, the impact on on wages have not been very large for the moment. There will be some delayed impact, maybe, but for the moment, there's no wage uh, price um, uh, uh, surplus. Uh, and it's true that clearly the supply. I mean, the energy shock is clearly. Uh, uh, ha has an impact as a cost push shock, but it's also a negative demand shock for households. And huh? we, uh, we've we heard some uh, of uh, what uh, Veronica was telling us about the impact on households' uh, income. Clearly, it's a negative uh, demand shock from that point of view. Uh, and we've seen that consumption is falling uh, in, 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 many, uh, in, in many parts of the, uh, the Eurozone because simply real income is, is, is falling. So from that point of view, uh, on the second part of the Phillips curve, on, you know, in some sense, the, the demand side, uh, the demand uh, dependent part of the inflation, uh, we already have uh, something that, is, that should at some point have a, a, a decreasing impact on, on, on inflation. And then there's the third impact, third factor in the uh, uh, new Canadian inflation curve, which is uh, expectations. Um, and here it's a bit difficult. Uh, I mean, for the we don't have as many uh, measures as in the US on expectations. Um, we don't have a lot of information to what extent the inflation expectations have been de anchored which is clearly uh, the big danger. Uh, for uh, for the eurozone and the big concern, of course, for 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 the ECB, um, it's true that the way we think about expectations, certainly the fact that energy and uh, you know the, uh, is is very um, visible, certainly has an impact on on inflation expectations. If we think of models of inflation expectations, which are not uh, maybe fully rational, but where the uh, the issue of uh, uh, the intensity of media attention, et cetera, et cetera, is, is important. So, but for the moment, as I said, in some sense, we don't know much. Uh, and, and clearly, the actions of the ECB, uh, because that, that's their mandate, their mandate is 2% inflation, is that even though the, 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 the ECB actions of increasing the interest rate won't have a direct impact uh, on, on, on uh, oil prices, gas prices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they are very concerned about inflation expectations be, being de-anchored. Um, I should say also that um, uh, uh, on the policy side, uh, a big part of the energy shock at different degrees in different uh, uh, European countries have been uh, uh, absorbed, in fact, by uh, fiscal policy. Um, more or less, and I think it's Bruegel who has uh, looked at that, but others have looked at this too, is that, and, and of course it's different across uh, Eurozone countries, the shock or the transfer uh, of purchasing power to the rest of the world and partly to the Russians is around 3 percentage point of GDP. Uh, and, and more or less, again, depending on countries, it's deep, different, but more or less, uh, out of this three percentage point, two percentage points have been absorbed by uh, by fiscal policy. At least this is the case, for example, uh, in, uh, in in France. So it's a big part. Uh, so two percentage point uh, for for fiscal policy, which is basically financed by by debt, and one percentage point by uh, by by households. For the moment, the firms, and again that may change, uh, have been uh, hit, but extremely heterogeneously. Huh? We have some firms which are making uh, huge profits and, and some firms that are hit very badly in the manufacturing sector. So as you know, uh, on these uh, fiscal measures, there are two types of, uh, of, uh, of measures. Uh, either you, uh, and, and Veronica clearly uh, alluded to the fact that this is uh, the type of measures she would prefer, targeted uh, uh, transfers to households, uh, which are the most modest or the more energy uh, dependent. Um, I'm all for it, but I'm going to maybe differ a bit uh, with Veronica on this because this is not so easy to put in place. If it was only an issue of income, we know how to do this. Uh, uh, we, we know, uh, you know, the, the taxed income, so we can do a transfer in, in France. In two weeks, you can send a check uh, to people below a certain level of, of, uh, of income. When, but the problem is that the heterogeneity is, is, is not only in terms of uh, income. The problem is that the heterogeneity depends very much where you are located and what is your equipment in terms of how you uh, heat yourself, um, whether you have one car or two cars, etc. Uh, so I'm all for 
more targeting hein, uh, and in particular in France. France has gone all the way towards the other type of measure I'm going to talk. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, favorable to, uh, to have more targeting, but let's not fool ourselves. I don't think it's going to be that easy to fully have a complete, you know, complete price signal and, and fully uh, uh, target, uh, best uh, total target towards the most modest and the most uh, energy dependent. So the second type of measures that have been uh, taken are price caps, rebates, etc. And in France, in particular, this has been uh, pretty, uh, pretty small. So we all know that economists prefer one to two. That's obvious. And we know the reasons. Uh, the number one is costly. Uh, uh, from a fiscal, uh, uh, sorry, uh, number two, the price caps, the rebates are very costly from a fiscal point of view. Although as one has to um, bear in mind that, you know, in France, when we do these rebates, it has a direct impact on the inflation rate. And that's one reason France has a pretty a lower inflation rate than the Eurozone. We are around 6% when the Eurozone is at 9%. So these policy measures have a macroeconomic impact. And when we have a 6% inflation rate rather than 9%, that means that quite a lot of the social benefits which are indexed to inflation are actually not increased. So in some sense, we're spending less because of, on, 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 in terms of social benefits, et cetera, et cetera, because of these non-targeted price caps. Um, now, I, I, the price caps we know have also problems in terms of uh, inefficiency. Clearly, uh, from a micro point of view, uh, they are inefficient because they send the, the, wrong, uh, the wrong price signal. But here, let's be modest. Do we know what is the size of the inefficiency cost of, of this? I, I'm not completely sure. I mean, uh, I've tried to look, and maybe um, some of you will have better answers than, than me, but what are the estimates when we have such a huge increase of prices of the price elasticity for households? Um, I mean, we don't have any estimate. Uh, so I've tried to look, I mean, uh, yes, maybe if there's a 10% increase in, uh, in, uh, in, in prices, we would be able to say this is what's going to happen to uh, a gas consumption of households. But uh, to be honest, I don't think we know. I mean, I've looked at uh, elasticities and in the short term, they would be around uh, pretty small, huh? around maybe zero one. But that when you have a huge increase in, uh, uh, in, uh, in prices, do, are we sure that these elasticities are you know, linear? They, they, they stay constant? I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and so the empirical evidence, I think, is, is, is pretty scarce. And I think we have a problem in terms of policy recommendation. Uh, because when we... Um, criticize price caps. We understand that one of the problem is the fact that we have excess demand and we'll have to deal with this excess demand. Except that if, uh, as George was saying, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the supply curve is vertical and the demand curve is uh, almost vertical too, because in the short term, the price elasticity is low, uh, maybe the excess demand is not that big. Uh, so, so we need to address these issues, uh, and I don't think it's very credible to say we're going to uh, have uh, the price signal uh, in such a way that it will uh, generate a 15% decrease in gas consumption by households. I mean, if we believe zero one, and I don't know, maybe it's too low, maybe even uh, too, too, too high, uh, that would mean a 150% increase in uh, prices of uh, gas for, for households. Do we, do we think that socially, politically, it's something feasible? I mean, so I, at some point, I think we, we reached the limit of uh, our uh, economics uh, exercise in terms of saying we should have zero price caps, uh, no, no rebates, no general issue. We know they're bad. I, I, I fully agree with that. But at some point, I think we reach uh, the limit of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this exercise. And the third thing I want to say about this uh, price cap, so yes, they have a fiscal cost. Yes, they have a micro or inefficiency cost uh, in terms of, uh, of the elasticity. And I'm going to be here a bit heterodox, but they have a macro gain uh, in the sense of uh, 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 reducing the inflation rate. Again, the, the inflation rate in France is around 6% in the sense that uh, there's an externality for the rest of the Eurozone, uh, macro externality, a positive and a negative. The positive one is that in a sense, and I've heard that from uh, pretty high level at the ECB, is that in some sense, we're making the life of ECB a bit easier uh, by, uh, um, but by spending all this money on, on these price caps on, on reducing inflation. 
it has a negative externality too, because France is actually uh, gaining some competitiveness uh, and, 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 and buying it with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with fiscal policy, which is not uh, supposed to be. Huh? We are not supposed to use the fiscal instrument to reduce uh, inflation and uh, increase competitiveness for, for, for France. So at some point, maybe the Commission is going to uh, say uh, uh, this is not exactly uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what you should do. Um, let me finish on, on nuclear. You know the situation, 32 uh, uh, two out of the 56 reactors are, are closed. Now, if we believe EDF, uh, the, 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 the French producers, uh, 28 should be reactivated by December and the rest by, by February. Now, we've been accustomed for EDF uh, saying things are fine or things are going to be fine and then to be uh, disappointed. Uh, but even if we have this, what will be the impact on electricity prices? I think in some sense here, I, I, uh, I, I agree with Veronica. I think that we should not expect a huge impact on, on electricity prices because the marginal, as long as the market works with uh, uh, prices being set by the marginal cost, the marginal cost is obviously not nuclear, it's, it's, it's gas. So the electricity price problem is a gas price problem. Uh, so as long as we don't solve the gas price problem, uh, I think, or, if, uh, or else we, sh we change completely the way uh, electricity prices are, are, uh, are, are set. Um, there have been some uh, debates on, on, on uh, how to use the information on the spread of the electricity price between Germany and France, which is around 15%, 15% it's 15% uh, lower in Germany than in France in some sense that would be uh, uh, one way to think about what would be the impact of uh, having zero problem anymore on, 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 uh, on nuclear. Uh, so we can expect maybe a 15% decrease in prices of uh, electricity, but not much more uh, uh, from, uh, from, from nuclear. However, there will be huge profits at EDF if, 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 you know, if all of a sudden the nuclear plants work well, uh, we're going to make huge profits. And I can tell you the French government is not going to still, uh, sit still. Uh, we're going to raise these profits. Uh, so what are we going to do with the money? I don't know yet, but uh, maybe we will uh, indeed use the money to uh, cap uh, electricity prices one way or another. But uh, uh, all I'm saying is that, you know, nuclear, of course, uh, if, uh, if nuclear, French nuclear works uh, again, that will be uh, very good. Not so much for the rest of Europe. As, as long as the, the electricity market uh, uh, works the same way, uh, but maybe the French will uh, will uh, will take the money and do another price cap on electricity prices, which won't help that much uh, the, the 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 rest uh, the rest of Europe. And just okay. the last word on 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 I'm, I'm finished uh, on on, uh, on on price caps uh, for uh, but at uh, at the European level because of course it's a very different debate. Um, with, uh, with Beatrice Weber Di Maro, and here I would depart, I guess, uh, from, uh, from George, uh, we, we had been in favor of a price cap uh, uh, on, on gas, but at the, all Europe, at the European level on the gas market, uh, and, and that means also on, on Norwegian gas, uh, because I don't think that uh, the idea of the Commission, which is uh, discussed today, which is a price cap only on Russian gas, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very good idea for reasons we can discuss. Uh, but I do think that, yes, we've never done sanctions on, on prices. We've always done sanctions on quantities. So we don't have experience of this type of, uh, of, uh, of sanctions. The same thing also for oil on, on uh, the, the American uh, the American idea on, on price cap on, on oil. We've never tried. Uh, there's a good chance that it doesn't work. But at this stage, I think it's worth trying. Okay, so Philip, thanks a lot. Uh, so we have now a very rich material on the table. And what I would like to do is I would like to ask uh, all the three panelists one clarifying questions and then I will kick off the Q and A. Um, let me let me start with uh, with with Georg. Georg um, so it was quite clear from my point of view what you said about the uh, the oil and, and, and taxing the imports on oil. Uh, the gas issue is a little bit more important in two dimensions, and there is also a question in, in, in the chat. First of all, it is not completely clear to me what you are saying about the, how uh, 
Europe should respond to the current gas embargo first. So my understanding is you say Europe should form a kind of a gas cartel on the gas market in order to, 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 to use the market power. But then at the same time, I'm not clear what you are saying about the credibility issue. So do you say that it is not credible that in the end we can get rid of the European, uh, the, the Russian gas imports? Or are you saying we shouldn't do this and we should also think about uh, have a, a, a kind of a gas import tax and also to, 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 to bring us in a, in a position also to, to lift the sanctions, for example, when Russia will make some concession uh, during the negotiations. So this was also some, some kind uh, of, of questions in the chat. So here I would like to hear a little bit more about this credibility issue. I was not sure uh, if, you, if you have used this in a normative way or in a descriptive way, and I am not totally clear how would, what is your proposal to deal with the gas, the Russian gas embargo in the short term and in the midterm, if you can clarify this a little bit. Hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, the, um, I think I, I was not entirely uh, clear in my presentation because I'm not kind of having the answer yet. I, I would rather put up the, uh, the question. Now, as I see it, what we currently have in place in terms of, of natural gas is that uh, the European Commission or the, the uh, also European leaders agree to essentially phase down imports of Russian gas by 2027, if I'm not mistaken, without any further specification. So there is no sanctions in place on Russian gas. There is no uh, uh, kind of no distribution of who gets how much. So it's only a kind of a phase out uh, uh, agreed. And I think this is not a credible uh, policy stance that we are uh, that we are having here. And uh, I think it's a rather risky one, especially as we currently are running around the world trying to sign LNG contracts with, with other suppliers, trying to, uh, to, to see which shares of the, of the value chain we have to outsource out of Europe to the US or other parts of the world. And um, the uh, uh, always kind of the, uh, the risk that at some point uh, Russian gas comes back into the into the market with, with low prices and undermining the, the business model of uh, of some of those uh, investments, and also kind of we have no tool currently to control Russian imports in a in a sense. So if Russia would now decide to uh, tomorrow deliver to Uniper 50 BCM per year. Uh, then probably Uniper would be happy to take it, and uh, and uh, we have no tool to to prevent that from happening. And that's uh, that's somewhat crazy in my view. Yeah. So what we what what so, we would need is uh, is a sort of framework. And I okay, we, we can say okay, we want a complete embargo, but. Um, I mean, I think we are past the discussion now, and uh, the Russians are essentially putting an embargo on us. So, what we what we at least need to develop now is a certain tool, and I think the the old French proposals about joint procurement here in this sense of of Russia make so much sense that we that we definitely need to to go for for something like that. And we should not only specify then in this thing that there's only one place in Europe to to which they sell, uh, one counterpart, but there's also this counterpart decides on where this gas is being delivered, not that they kind of use it to congest or kind of uh, put put uh, 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 benefits to individual countries, when, how much, at what, what price. I know that it's politicization of, of gas. We we always did not want that, but I think uh, it's it's quite clear that we uh, that we need that now. And we need this institution relatively quickly and, and stably because the crisis will be over at some point and the, uh, the temptation to, to get this 50 BCM for, for a little price for a specific company uh, will, be, will be very high. And uh, so let, let's do it now. Okay, th thanks, thanks, uh, Georg. Veronica, one question to you. Um, and here I would also like to ask you for a short clarification. And Philip also asked this question. So you are now advocating the, the extension of the lifetime for nuclear power plants in Germany. And your main argument is not so much to substitute gas, but at least I understand your argument that you want to use the, the nuclear power plants uh, to, to, uh, as, a, as a kind of an insurance against uh, uh, price spikes. So, my, my, so this is my, my first question. So what is your assessment? How, how, much, how much would you expect? Because uh, 
yeah, I would say my guess is probably not too much because uh, the, the nuclear power plant is, is, is not the price setting technology. And the second aspect I would like to ask you, uh, because you mentioned uh, due to the high gas prices, so there's a, a huge risk that we have more uh, coal-fired plants in particular in Germany, but also in other European countries. And here, of course, the ETS-1, the current ETS comes in place with the CO2 price. And here I would like to ask you, so what is your recommendation? Because we see a lot of pressure at the European level also not uh, to, to intervene in 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 the um, in in the emission market. So, if you could comment on on these two issues, uh, price by the nuclear power and CO two prices and ETS one. Yeah, thank you very much um, uh, for the possibility to clarify a little bit. Um, I think um, there are several reasons why we should extend the nuclear power plants. One is um, that um, indeed. Um, it will relieve a little bit the price pressure, not very much probably, but um, it is not always uh, the gas power plants that set the price, but it is also the inframarginal plants um, if uh, electricity demand is low. It's sometimes even uh, the renewables. Um, and uh, the more uh, we move uh, the merit order outwards, the more often uh, demand intersects with the merit order, with supply, um, at a low cost technology. Um, and of course, um, this will not be done only by nuclear power plants, but by mobilizing now every um, capacity that is available on short notice. And this is uh, nuclear power plants and coal power plants. Um, and I think, um, um, I think uh, the argument that the gas prices always set the price. This is just not right. Um, they often set the price because we have a lot of scarcity um, of um, supply in the electricity market. And this concerns also France. Also, France is depending on uh, the gas fired power plants uh, if they um, determine the price in the European e electricity market because there is not so enough supply uh, of other um, sources. Uh, so that is one reason. The second reason is in the medium term. Um, so we will have to um, extend and heavily use coal fired power plants. Um, and this will generate a lot of CO2 emissions. And you can assess a little bit how, uh, what is the impact um, on the um, emission price in the, on the CO2 price in the emission trading system. And it is definitely far beyond the five euro that we just uh, suspended as an increase um, in the national emission trading um, in Germany was uh, in the context of the relief package. So the question is, um, that is it worth to uh, reduce the possibility uh, to um, that uh, the CO2 price is increasing by say 40, 50, 60, uh, Euro, because there's a lot of emissions uh, coming in the upcoming years if we um, heavily use our coal-fired coal power plants. And the third reason would be um, the bargaining power of the German government if it comes to defending all the institutions in the electricity market and defending uh, if they want to defend um, the emission trading system. If we uh, shut, up, shut off uh, our nuclear power plants and emit a lot of CO2 uh, and then come and say, ah, but please don't touch the emission trading system, that's not very credible. Um, so uh, I think also in order to have some uh, good bargaining position when it comes to uh, talk about uh, European institutions in the context of climate protection, I think it's very important uh, to, ha to have a good position and not to damage the position from the onset. And uh, I think the foreign countries look at us uh, a little bit and are a little bit puzzled uh, what, is, what is happening here. So um, this is basically uh, the three reasons um, we are just about to assess it for the medium term. And for the medium term, I mean, for the short term, there's not so much impact. But for the medium term, you see that there is quite some impact, but I have no reliable numbers yet. But you see that there is quite some impact. Um, two uh, quick issues, targeted transfers. Uh, Philippe, I'm very much with you, but I think it's not a zero one uh, issue. So there are also 
untargeted transfers that are undesirable. And uh, I think also if you cannot uh, do targeted transfer, I think we are much in a much uh, worse shape in Germany than you in France, because we cannot target low income people um, very well. So, um, and this uh, means that we have to improvise, but um, I think you can also do it very badly by uh, these um, um, gasoline rebates and uh, value tax rebates and so on. And you can do it a little bit more okay. clever. Um, so, and um, one last issue, el elasticities. Um, I agree very much, we have not good data, but at the moment, what you hear from German industry they reduce their gas consumption a lot and they have a lot of um, possibilities to do so even at, at, at these whole high prices a lot of things are happening which we would ne never have dreamed of um, if you just uh, get in context and so on i think the electric uh, elasticity is also in the short run have been very much underestimated at the beginning of the crisis okay thanks veronica philip uh, you made a, a very, very interesting point. You said uh, price caps, uh, uh, you acknowledge uh, fully the uh, inefficiency and so on, the usual microeconomic arguments, but at the same time, you said uh, there are macroeconomic gains. And it seems to me that there's an interesting trade off here. On the one hand, uh, we see a lot of uh, price interventions, which in the end have a huge potential to increase the energy consumption uh, uh, in, in Europe. And if you look at the, at the data, there is a lot of, of very perverse incentive in the current situation. But on the other hand, there, there is a macroeconomic gain. And that's, that's a quite interesting aspect here. And uh, probably you might clarify this point and also Veronica uh, uh, raised this issue uh, again. Because it seems to me that's a, a, an interesting debate be, between microeconomists and macroeconomists. And uh, there, there are two issues here. On the one hand, we have allocative efficiency and also equity issues, which are quite important. But at the same time, we have macroeconomic issues in a way which you have highlighted uh, do not fit very well in the usual thinking about inflation, be it on the labor market and, and, and so on. Probably you might elaborate a little bit on, on this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a word on 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 uh, with Veronica. We, we I think we agree. I, I mean, I um, corner solutions where uh, you know there's zero pass through and zero price signal to households is is a very bad idea. And I do think that in France we we've, we've went too far in that direction, and that we uh, should go towards more pass through of prices to consumers and and more targeted uh, transfers, even if they are difficult. But I think you will agree also, uh, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> uh, that, that, that full, full pass-through of uh, wholesale prices to, to households, I know that part of the price of households is not uh, the wholesale price, but would be extremely difficult. And I'm not sure we should expect a big decrease in, in consumption of household, even if we had this huge increase in, uh, in, in prices, okay? So I think, but, you know, uh, I don't know exactly where we can, uh, and maybe we would disagree on, you know, where we are uh, in, uh, in, in the percentage of pass-through, but, but, but uh, I agree that uh, we don't like, uh, I mean, the, the corner solutions are certainly not optimal. Um, and or feasible. On, on your question, uh, uh, Otmar, uh, so I'm not sure, I mean, um, thanks for saying it's interesting, but I'm not sure I can go much further. So I reach the, you know, the limit of this inter intellectual debate because yes, uh, there are uh, uh, microeconomic uh, uh, losses in uh, this type of policies, um, you know, all these triangles. I don't know how large they are and it depends very much on the, uh, empirical estimates of this elasticity, both on the supply side and the demand side. So here I would wait for my, my micro uh, friends to give me some uh, empirical estimates that I think we are missing. Uh, on the macro gains, um, frankly, this is not the way we think about uh, the use of fiscal policy on inflation. So it's a bit heterodox and I'm not sure we have a, a quantitative uh, 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 measure of, of these macroeconomic uh, gains. 
Uh, there are some models that have tried to look at, you know, price caps in Argentina uh, and where they basically were finding that, you know, in the short term, it's, uh, it's, it's good because indeed there's less inflation, but in the middle and long term, then the microeconomic inefficiencies come back with a revenge. And, and so we have to be super careful. And so in the medium and long term, I'm all, for, uh, I'm all with the microeconomist. Huh? Uh, from that point of view, we have to be careful. Uh, we are also in a strange situation, at least at the beginning. Remember at the beginning of this crisis, so fiscal policy were you, was used to combat inflation with price caps, rebates, et cetera. And monetary policy was doing what? Was, was you know, holding uh, things so that uh, in, in particular, the objective was to uh, not to have a big increase in spreads uh, in, uh, across Eurozone countries because the spreads would have made it difficult uh, uh, for some governments to finance themselves on, on that market. So we had a complete inversion of the objectives of monetary policy and fiscal policy. Normally, we think of monetary policy as combating inflation and fiscal policy in charge of debt and fiscal issues. Here we were this completely strange so, uh, uh, situation where monetary policy, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, where monetary policy was in charge of making uh, the financing of governments easier and fiscal policy was in charge of combating inflation with fiscal measures. That, that's just can't work yeah. that, that way. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that may be also an interesting remark. Yeah. Again, I'm reaching the limit of it because in some sense, as long as we can't uh, have a quantitative exercise on this, I'm not sure. But I, I, but I still think it's important to have these macroeconomic impacts of these uh, debates in mind, especially in the situation we are right now. Yeah, that's, that, I think that's very important. So in the end, it boils down a little bit to the question, how large the Marshallian triangles are. And this reminds me to a very old bad joke where people said in Oxford, workers unite, you have nothing to lose in a few Marshallian triangles. And uh, in the current gas crisis, you could say consumer unite, you have nothing to lose than a few Marshallian triangles. So it's a bad joke in the current situation, but uh, uh, I was tempted to make it. Now, there's a question here in the chat, a very important one, because we promised we will say something on climate policy in times of war. We talked a lot about energy security, but not too much on, on the climate issue. So I would like to bring in uh, this dimension, and uh, uh, I would like to ask the panelists to respond to this, because if you look at the numbers, so the implication of the European Green Deal is that gas imports and oil imports in general, but also gas and oil imports from Russia would decline even before 2030, even without the Ukrainian war. So this is a very fundamental insight. Here. And uh, uh, in, in, in the most recent uh, paper, um, Georg made this uh, argument again. So my question here is a, a little bit, so uh, there's the proposal to form a gas and oil cartel. And in the end, this would lead to, to a reduction of oil and gas imports from Russia. But what we need is to make the Green Deal great again is a decline and a reduction of the, the amount of the total amount of oil and gas imports. And at the European level, so there was a, an idea to implement a second ETS for the transport and building, was, which was roughly an upstream system for oil and gas. Now, the second ETS is, uh, is, is a little bit sick in the hospital, so to say. And, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Georg and to, to, to comment a little bit. So on the one hand, how could we combine and bring together the energy security issue and the climate policy a little bit closer? And is then forming a gas and oil cartel, which reduces the oil and gas imports, uh, the new substitute uh, for the SIG ETS2? So you might, Georg and Veronica, but also Philip, you might comment on this. Um. If I may, I would zoom out a bit more kind of on this kind of crisis versus versus climate question. And um, I think we, we don't have the answer. The answer will be uh, will be the politics that we are uh, or policy that we are going to see in the crisis. What I observe is we see a lot of lock in in fossil investment at the moment. And it seems that this uh, kind of because they are having comparatively lower fixed costs, 
um, at the at the beginning, we we might still see that uh, that we are continuing or risking to essentially lock in and delaying decarbonization. At least that seems to be government policy in uh, in several member states. Uh, even so, it's not clearly expressed as such. So I'm I'm relatively relatively worried because money is uh, is getting scarce. We have to rearm, and uh, we have the high energy prices. So uh, there seems to be a, a, a some some movement to to really kind of postpone the uh, the green deal in in real politic uh, even so the statements all still look nice um the the other point is that that i find extremely important and this was also part of the reason why we wrote this paper is i'm quite worried about institutions because a lot of these things that we have been discussing on price caps and so on a national um, uh, on a national level i'm quite worried that some of these things we have been building over the past 30 years uh, like electricity mark european electricity markets or uh, emission trading systems might get uh, yeah might get under the bus in the current crisis and um, i think it's not a uh, not impossible to think of that. Somebody in the chat asked for why do we not renationalize the entire sector? And I think those, if the crisis goes on, there there is a, a substantial risk that some countries will will go in that direction. And if we kill the the single market for for carbon permits, but also for electricity, it's not going to be possible to have a sensible decarbonization in the European Union anymore because then everybody would just build whatever they can in, in terms of gas and coal and, and just look on, on what is what is closest. And then a the last, uh, even, even a bit more remote area is the, is the question of, of carbon of industry. I mean, we might potentially see quite, quite substantial decarbonization in Europe uh, by, by industry leaving the European Union, uh, especially energy intensive and, ca uh, and carbon intensive industry. Is that a good or a bad thing? Uh, well, our policy stance is still we, we try to stem against that with carbon border adjustment mechanisms and uh, subsidizing them, giving free allowances and so on. I'm increasingly wondering whether we are doing the right thing here. I mean, whether we should not let part of that go because it's not only that they are carbon intensive, they are also very energy intensive. And Europe has become significantly energy poorer in the, in the past years. So maybe we would need a significant readjustment of our way in which we deal with, uh, with carbon intensive industry in Europe that finds ways of decarbonizing those outside of the European Union, even so we, uh, we uh, initially preferred to, to do that, uh, to do that domos uh, domestically. So maybe three or four elements that yeah, not completely answer your question, but give you some of my yeah. thoughts. Thanks, Georg. So now we have yeah, two, minutes, maybe... two, minutes, two minutes left. I have to close at, at seven sharp. So I promised this to the organizers. So two minutes and you can share, Veronica, your two minutes with Philip, or Philip can trade you the one minute. So please go ahead. I can try to make it very quick. Um, I disagree. Um, I, I mean, money is getting scarce, you said, but it's public money that is getting scarce. Um, private money is not scarce. There's a lot of money all over the world uh, that could be mobilized to invest to be invested in the energy transformation. Um, I think the problem is a combination. Public money is getting scarce, um, and this and institutions that foster climate protection are at stake. And this combination, I think, is a big threat uh, to climate uh, protection because this may, uh, has the consequence that also private money is not mobilized. And I think this would be the clue to mobilize private investment in order to uh, for the transformation and not only in Europe, but um, to invest in Europe and in projects worldwide. And I think this is what we should aim at to um, establish the institutions such that private money is mobilized. Uh, in this situation. And this is a very hard issue at the moment because um, the direction is more to damage institutions that would do it. Okay, Philip, now, if you like, you have the very last word now. It's not a word, it's actually a question for all of you, all the, the, the panelists, but uh, also uh, those who are uh, uh, listening to, to us. Um, if you have some estimates of what are these elasticities, super important elasticities for households on, on, on gas consumption, 
uh, I mean, we should all, uh, this is an appeal from, from a macro to a micro, to micro economies. Uh, we should all work on this uh, right now because this is a huge question. So don't hesitate, send me emails. Uh, if you have, uh, if you are working on that, uh, actually at the French Council, there's some work being done uh, in the present circumstances. But if you have some some ideas, some numbers, I'll, I'll take them and I'll cite them, of course, enormously. So thanks. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, all the participants and all the panelists. I apologize that we haven't been able to answer all the questions in the Q and A. So this was an extremely rich debate, uh, an extremely rich material, a lot of things which have to be discussed further and thought through. So the elasticity is an important aspect, the Marshallian triangles, the macroeconomic implications, the future of climate policy in Europe. So this is quite interesting. And I would say we are now living in very, very challenging times. And even if we as economists have not all of the questions at hand, at least it is a lot uh, which we, which policymakers ask us to come up with reasonable proposals, and I think we we should do this in a in a quite modest way. But we should not be shy to participate in the public debate. I like to thank all of you, and I hope we can continue this debate uh, 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 very near in the future. Thanks a lot, and have a nice evening.